Amen and amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Let me say good evening to everyone. Good evening to everyone and good evening to our brothers and sisters online. I want to wish you all a wonderful welcome today. Welcome one and all. Welcome ladies. Welcome gentlemen. Welcome Holy Spirit. You know, as I was coming in and I saw all the brethren, I saw, I said, you know, the Bible says we two are more gather touching anything concerning the kingdom of God. Jesus promised that he will be here. What do you say? And tonight, friend, it is all about who? Jesus. And we are confident that he's here to bless. We are confident that he's here to heal and transform life. And we want him to transform our life in a special way. What do you say? And so we're going to stand tonight as we sing our fellowship song. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Please stand wherever you are. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Oh, oh I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed, cleansed by His blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel along. I'm so glad. Now the action part. Now we're gonna reach out. We're Are we gonna touch somebody now? Let's reach out now. Reach out now. Come on now. Reach out and touch. Touch. Somebody. Oh 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 oh. And make this church a better place. Yes, we can. Reach out and touch. Somebody. a better place yes we can I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God I've been washed in this fountain cleansed by his blood joy Lord, praise the Lord. Hold on to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, Jesus loves you, and so do I. Amen. You may be seated. What do you say about that? It is said there is no true worship without fellowship. And so you got a fellowship one with the other. Yeah, I got a fellowship. You're going to make sure your, your brother and your sister, they're all covered. Amen. We are supposed to be your brother's keeper. Doesn't what that God asks Cain about his brother? Huh? We are supposed to be. Yes, they came to thought the other way. Huh? Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. We are our brother's keeper. We got to make sure we are keeping our brothers covered. Amen. We got to make sure we touch one. Each one touch one. You know, I went to uh, a family. This came here, and I picked up a few things, and I left not too far from here. Some, some, some months ago, I think it was some months ago, we went into the community, and we were inviting people for a program that we were having. We, I think we were doing some surveys. I think it was when Pastor Not Time, I, or before that. But remember, we, went, we are always going out, by the way. And um, we went to a family, and somehow the, the, the family, the husband called back and requested Bible study. In fact, the husband said that he wants to get baptized. <laughs> I am telling you, friends, I'm telling you. So we got to make sure we are reaching somebody. Amen. We got to make sure you're telling somebody about Jesus because the harvest is ripe. Jesus said it. It was the disciple who said it, you know. It was Jesus who said the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. And he says, you should pray that the Lord of harvest will send forth laborers. Are you a laborer in God's garden? The field. Amen. So we want to work. Let me see the hands of those who are coming for the very first time. The first timers. God bless you, my brother. God bless you, my sister. We are happy to have you here today. What's your name, my brother? 
Brother Walters and sister Walters. And they are from Eliatha. The Walters are here from Eliatha. Sister Sister Neil says, she, she. Is she invited here? You know? I am so happy to see you, my sister. You see? Yes, you gotta you gotta bring more. In the name of Jesus. What do you say about that? Yeah. And so let me see the hands of those who have never missed a night. You have never missed an evening. Never, ever. All right, Pastor Blake one. Sister Eula, this, wait, 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 wait. We we can't start giving out present at all. <laughs> <laughs> we have to wait until tomorrow evening. God bless you. Let us keep faithful because Jesus is coming soon. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord, Bridget. You know, as we are being revived spiritually, we got to be revived with our financial life. So what do you say? There's a, it's a thing that says you give to live. Giving is living. Something that doesn't give is dying. Amen? And so at this time, we're going to have an offering li lift up tonight, and we're going to have a prayer, and then our deacon is going to come, and he's going to pick up this night's offering. We want to remind those online that they might return their offering via, via, via Zelle, and the, the number would be on the screen momentarily. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege of life. We thank you, Lord, that you have sustained us to see another Sabbath day. Lord, we praise you for your grace and for your mercy. And now, loving God, we are here worshiping in your presence. And Lord, it feels so good to be in the house of God. In a special way, we are praying that you'll bless these gifts that we are about to return to bless your holy name. And may souls become to know Jesus Christ as a result of the faithfulness of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Our deacon going to come now. And the blessings are falling today. It's joy, joy, joy in my heart. Says Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old spotted garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. Blessings are falling tonight. It's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old spotted garment, he gave me a robe of pure white and feasted on heavenly manner. That's why I'm so happy tonight. Amen. What do you say? Praise the Lord. No, one of my favorite things about this revival has been the time of prayer. What do you say? I don't know if you can tell us some of the, our prayer emphasis. Anybody remember some of our prayer emphasis throughout this revival? What is some of Evangelism was one. Praise the Lord. Family was one. One more. Unity was one more. Amen. And, and the person who can tell us all the prayer emphasis tomorrow, you're going to get a big hug from me, all right? <laughs> Tonight, we are happy that we have um, our Ella right here with us. He's going to be praying for us tonight. And our emphasis tonight is going to be on the Holy Spirit. Do we need the Holy Spirit? We must have the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, he gives it to those who ask. Amen? And so tonight, we're going to ask. Days are filled. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lowly, lowly and jeer, but burdens are lifted at Calvary. Let us kneel. Jesus is very
our Father. It is in the precious name of Jesus that we approach our eternal throne this evening. We are indeed grateful to you, Lord, for your goodness to us. In that you have brought us through another week. And upon the threshold of another Sabbath day, we just want to tell you thanks. For all the obstacles that you have brought us over. Sometimes we feel like we were in valleys, but you have exalted us. Sometimes the mountain seems so hard to climb, but you have made them low enough for us, Lord, that we could go over. And so we want to exalt you tonight. We want to just magnify you and lift you up. I hear somebody ask the question, who is like unto you? And in return, the answer was, there is none like unto thee. For you are indeed glorious in holiness. And you are fearful in praises. Always doing wonders. There is none like you. And so as we come tonight, Lord, with our hearts turned up to you. And the request that is on our hearts tonight, Lord, is that you will come by here and that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit. Father, we recognize that for the word to be effective and go forth with power, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The disciples was wondering when would you put in your own power? Or when will you restore the kingdom to Israel? But you said to them, it is not for you to know the time or the season. When the father would put in his own power. But tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And after you have been endued with power from on high, you're going to be witnesses of me. And Lord, tonight, for us to be effective witnesses, we need your Holy Spirit to empower us. And so we ask that you will come by here tonight, Father. Yeah. And in a very special way that you will baptize us tonight as we lift our hearts to you. As we hunger and thirst after you tonight, Father, we pray that you will indeed fill us so that we will indeed be effective witnesses for you, Father. Lord, we recognize that there are those around us who are dying for the truth and for the light to come. But unless we are filled, we cannot do the things that we need to do for you. And so your word tells us that whosoever is in need of the Holy Spirit, we should ask, and you will give us liberally. And so we're asking you tonight, Father, to baptize us one more time. Lord, we pray that not only will you baptize us one more time, but that you will help us to cultivate that habit or that environment where the Holy Spirit can resonate with us. So that he will stay with us not only in church, but stay with us at home, stay with us on the road, stay with us wherever we go. So that we can be effective for you. Bless us now tonight, Father. Bless your man servant again as he would seek to minister to us. We ask that you will open our spirits tonight. And we pray that as we are being enlightened, Lord, indeed the light will shine. And your name be glorified in and through us. Thanks for hearing us again tonight, Lord. Amen. As we look to you, we give all praise and glory and honor to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen and amen. amen.
Good night, church family. How is everybody doing? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? If we could get just a little bit more volume. Amen. Amen. Who here is happy that it is the Sabbath? Amen. Amen. You know, we're actually told in the spirit of prophecy that uh, as it were, as soon as the Sabbath ends, that we should be earnestly looking forward to the next Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is literally the best day of the entire week. And this, this mindset of looking forward to the sacred time is a disposition that we really need to cultivate. You know, because the Sabbath is not merely a time where we get off from work. It's not merely a time where, you know, we turn off Netflix for 24 hours. Uh, it is a sacred and holy time for us to be able to commune with heaven. And especially as we know, the, the, in light of the crisis that is coming, it's going to be much more than just whether or not we believe that the seventh day is the Sabbath, but do we have an actual experience with the Lord on this particular day? And so, uh, as has been our custom, uh, we are going to have a quiz. We're going to have a quiz. Now, again, by show of hands, who here loves quizzes? <laughs> Amen. So, uh, in one of our uh, past quizzes, there was actually a prize uh, or a, a number of prizes that were given to those who got 100%. Now, unfortunately, there was no one who received 100%, but we had uh, two uh, blessed individuals that got 70%. And so they were awarded with uh, just compensation. And so, uh, in light of that, we're going to have another quiz. We're going to have another quiz. Uh, we have six questions. We have six questions this evening. Now, why do you think it's good for us to go over things like this again and again? Yes, for repetition so that it can be indelibly impressed into our conscience. All right, now, before we begin, I'm just going to have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll go over it. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much uh, for the sacred and holy time as we pause very quickly uh, for this uh, question, uh, these question and answers, we just pray that this be a savor of life into life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, question number one. Question number one. The question says, what was one of the professions of Ezra? 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 Uh, did everybody get that? Amen. All right, question number two, it says, What were the names of the three monarchs who issued decrees for the restoration of Jerusalem? What were the names of the three monarchs who issued decrees for the restoration of Jerusalem? What were the name of the three monarchs who issued decrees for the restoration of Jerusalem? And this series of questions, this is an open book test. This is an open book test. All right, did everybody get that question? Okay, question number three. It says, why is prayer so important to our spiritual life? Why is prayer so important to our spiritual life? Why is prayer so important to our spiritual life? Why is prayer so important to our spiritual life? All right, that was question number three. Question number four, it says, what chapter of Luke helps to describe how to offer effectual prayer. What chapter of the book of Luke helps to describe how to offer effectual prayer? All right, question number six. According to Steps to Christ, what is the first thing we need when seeking to pray to God? 
According to Steps to Christ, what is the first thing we need when seeking to pray to God? I'm sorry, say it again. Question number five. Yes, this is question number five. Yeah. I said six? Oh, my apologies. My apologies. All right, so this is actually question number six. Name three persons in the Bible who had strong prayer lives. Name three persons in the Bible who had strong prayer lives. Again, name three persons in the Bible who had strong prayer lives. All right, now did everybody get those questions? All right, so let's start back from the beginning. All right, question number one. Now, does anybody need me to repeat any of the questions? <laughs> Only six. Only six. All right, question number three. Uh, that question said, why is prayer so important to our spiritual life? Why is prayer so important to our spiritual life? Why is prayer so important to our spiritual life. Why is prayer so important to our spiritual life? All right. All right, so I'm going to start back from the beginning. All right, question number one, it says, what was one of the professions of Ezra? Okay, so he was a scribe. He was a scribe. That was one of his professions. Probably the most notable. All right, question number two. What were the three names? What were the three? Uh, what were the names, pardon, of the three monarchs who issued decrees for the restoration of Jerusalem? Cyrus, Cyrus Darius, Darius, and Artaxerxes Longmanus. Now, uh, what decree do we use? in order to uh, initiate the beginning of the 2300 days. I'll say it again. Yes, a hazardous. Now, why do we use, well, not a hazardous, but uh, Artaxerxes, why do we use his, his decree? Why do we use his decree? Now, this is a bonus question. This is a bonus question, yes. Actually, actually you know what, uh, just, uh, actually, just pause. <laughs> uh, because you are married to the evangelist, um, Unfortunately, I think that this may disqualify you for this, uh, for this particular question. Now, does anybody have uh, an answer to, uh, to that question? I'm sorry, say it again? A fresh order to go back. Now, the other decrees were, was also as well in order for them to go back, but there is a particular reason why we use the decree of Artaxerxes. There was something special about his decree. There was something very special about his decree that the other decrees did not have. Okay, it's uh, something specific. That, that's a little bit warmer. So the decree of Artaxerxes helped to restore the judicial jurisdiction of the nation. Exactly. Not just the temple, but they had their own civil authority comprising themselves. And so that was the great reason why that decree of Artaxerxes is, is used. All right. Uh, question number three. Why is prayer so important to our spiritual life? Why is prayer so important to our spiritual life? Yes, it's the communication between us and God. Yes, the power to overcome. Grace and uh, strength can be found in prayer. It's, it's impossible to be a proper Christian and not pray. It's literally impossible. Yes, the birth of the soul. Question number four, it says, what chapter of Luke helps to describe how to offer effectual prayer? Yes, Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. 
Question number five, according to Steps to Christ, what is the first thing we need when seeking to pray to God? Yes, to fill our need of prayer, to fill our need of prayer. So we need to pray that God will help us to see our need of communing with him. Uh, and last question number six, name three persons in the Bible who had strong prayer lives. Jesus, okay, that's a given. Daniel, Job, Moses, Abraham, who else? Elijah, yes, Jeremiah, yes, the three worthies, Daniel, yes, so there's many people, can we name any women who had strong prayer lives in the Bible? Hannah, yes, Hannah, yes, Mary, did Mary had a strong prayer life, what about Jochebed, the mother of, of Moses? Yes, she also had a very strong prayer life. Now, I see that the time is already 8 o'clock, and um, that time is a little past. Now, who here, by show of hands, is in a rush to get back home? All right, uh, that's good, because uh, by God's grace, tonight and tomorrow morning, we have some very serious things to go over. And I'm really praying that by God's grace, the Lord can really give us wisdom and understanding to comprehend the reality of how intense This really is, and so that we can be able to understand it step by step. And so in light of that, I'm not going to delay any further. Uh, Let us just kneel very quickly and have a word of prayer, and by God's grace, I will begin. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for... This Sabbath, we thank you so much for this sacred and holy time. The Lord, I pray that you would please be with us here as a church family. As we have come to church this evening to hear special words from heaven, we know that we're living at, in the very toenails, as it were, of this earth's history. As we go over some of the pressing things that pertain to these last days tonight, we pray that you would please give us wisdom and understanding that we may comprehend these things, not only intellectually, but especially spiritually. Dear Lord, we're praying that these truths will really help to transform our lives. I pray, dear Father, that you would please be with my heart and my mind. I pray that you would please calm my mind and my nerves, dear Lord, that this message may be communicated properly. Uh, that any of my excitement will not take away from this being comprehended properly. And I just pray that you would please keep us to this end. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It is very unfortunate that this week of prayer is, or this two-week Revival and Reformation series is, is already coming to a close. I mean, it is amazing to think that we've already been here for two weeks already. It is amazing. But without further ado, let's open up our Bibles to the book. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of First Corinthians. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of First Corinthians. Let's notice what the Bible says in First Corinthians chapter 10. As has been our custom, First Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to start in verse number 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to start in verse number 10. And again, just a small little caveat. If you have a cell phone, please either put this on silent or turn it off whatever device you may have, for we certainly do not want the enemy to distract us from what God is going to communicate. All right, so verse number 10, it says, Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the, of the destroyer. It says, Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples. And again, what does that word ensamples mean? It means examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are what? Now, were the ends of the world coming upon the Apostle Paul? No, they weren't. They're coming upon us in this generation. It says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he do what? Now, what does it mean to stand in a spiritual context? It means to not sin. It means to not sin. Now, when we, when we sin... Sometimes we describe it as falling into sin. So in light of that, what does falling mean? Yes, it means to sin. So the Bible is saying, Wherefore let him that thinketh he is without sin 
take heed lest he fall into sin. Does that make sense? All right, in verse 13, it says, There had no temptation taken you, but such as is common to what? Again, contrary to popular opinion, how Satan, Satan tries to impress this upon our minds, every temptation that we, are, uh, that we are oppressed with, these are temptations that are common to man. Again, we are not the only person that is going through whatever trial that we are going through. And we can always have the consolation that whatever we are currently going through or have gone through in the past, Jesus has gone through way worse. Do you know that in Desire of Ages, it literally says that Jesus was tempted in proportion to the perfection of his holiness. Now, how holy was Christ? He was infinitely holy. So in proportion to the uh, infinity level of his holiness, that was the severity of the temptation that was pressed upon him. Now, was that serious? That is very serious. Now, did Jesus have a mediator between he and God? Jesus had no mediator. Jesus had nobody to plead for him. But do we have a mediator? So do we really have it as hard as Jesus did? Not even a fraction. Not even a fraction. All right, it says, such is this common to man, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also may a, make a way to escape that ye may be able to do what with the, with the temptation, that ye may be able to bear it. All right, now in light of that, this is a, the, our theme passage that we have been reading this entire two-week Revival and Reformation series. Again, many are casting contempt upon the Old Testament scriptures, but these are not to lose their sacredness throughout all time. They are not to be dropped out of our instruction. The prophets spoke less for their own time than for the ages which have followed and for our own day. So again, these prophets of antiquity, they wrote especially for our time as opposed to their own time. Now, we have been going through many of the principles that contributed directly to the captivity of the ancient Hebrews in them going into Babylon. Now, what is the theme of this two-week Revival and Reformation series? The Closing Captivity. Now, in our last uh, message, we were talking about some of the experience of Ezra and how God used him mightily in the restoration and the building of Jerusalem with all of its subsequent um, uh, features. Now, one of the things that we brought out about the experience of Ezra was his strong prayer life. And again, did Ezra have a very strong prayer life? Ezra had a very strong prayer life. But for this evening, we're about to go over the experience of a particular person uh, that was in prominence during this time. And we're going to see the correlation of that individual to our present day. Now, does anybody know who this bust is a representation of? This is a gentleman by the name of Cyrus. Anybody ever heard of Cyrus? Yes, this is the same Cyrus that Isaiah prophesied of. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ezra. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ezra. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ezra. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ezra. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ezra chapter 6. Ezra chapter 6, we're going to read in verse 14. Ezra chapter 6 and verse 14, and when you have it, you can say amen. All right, the Bible says, And the elders of the Jews built it, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo. And they built it and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of who? Of Cyrus. So the first person to issue a decree was the monarch named Cyrus. Then it says, And Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. So again, these were the three decrees that God was able to use for the restoration and building of Jerusalem as they were coming out of that 70 years captivity. Notice, 
Now, this is just an historical point. This says, in the first year of the reign of Cyrus, which was the 70th from the day that our people were removed out of their own land into Babylon, God commiserated the captivity and calamity of these poor people. For he stirred up the mind of who? And again, Isaiah prophesied of the reign of Cyrus over a hundred years before Cyrus, Cyrus was even born. It says, and made him write this throughout all Asia. This says, thus saith uh, the king, uh, Cyrus the king, since God Almighty hath appointed me to be king of the habitable earth, I believe that he is that God which the nation of the Israelites worship. Now, this is amazing that Cyrus was saying this because was Cyrus an Israelite? Cyrus was a heathen monarch, but he was acknowledging the supremacy of of the God that his Hebrew captives worshipped. Amazing. This says, For indeed he foretold by name by the prophets, and that I should build him a house at Jerusalem in the country of Judea. And this is so astonishing. Why are we not taught this in history classes? I mean, you can't make this up. Cyrus, again, was prophesied long before he was even born, and he was called out by name. This is just a historical fact, whether you're religious or not. All right, again, this is from a book called The Antiquities of the Jews, written by the first century uh, Jewish uh, Roman historian named Josephus. Notice, this was foretold by Isaiah 140 years before the temple was demolished. Talking about the first temple. Accordingly, when Cyrus read this and admired the divine power and earnest desire and and uh, ambition sees uh, ambition seized upon him to fulfill what was so written. So he called for the most eminent Jews that were in Babylon and said to them that he gave them leave to go back to their own country. Now this is a principle: the way Cyrus responded to prophecy is the same way we should ourselves respond to prophecy. Now, when Cyrus saw that God had prophesied of these things, he moved with fear to fulfill the will of God. Now, in light of all of these prophecies that God has given to us, do you think that it would be well for us to imitate the example of Cyrus? Yes. It says that they should contribute to them gold and silver for the building of the temple and besides that, beasts for their sacrifices. All right, now, does anybody know who this monarch is? That was a hint. We just read about him in Ezra chapter 6. Now, we just went over Cyrus. Who do you think this is? This is Darius. Yes, good guess. This says, there are but four events which can be taken as answering the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. These are the decree of Cyrus for the rebuilding of the house in B.C. 536, the decree of Darius for the prosecution of that work, which had been hindered in what year? What year was that decree? 519. And this is taken from a very powerful book called Daniel and the Revelation, written by one of our Adventist pioneers, Uriah Smith. All right, notice this. Under the favor shown them by Cyrus, nearly 50,000 of the children of the captivity had taken advantage of the decree permitting their return. These, however, in comparison with the hundreds of thousands scattered throughout the provinces of Medo-Persia, were but a what? A remnant. It has always been a remnant to serve the Lord. Now, don't get me wrong. Is 50,000 a lot of people? That's a lot of people, but in comparison to how many people were in that vast empire, this was but a remnant. This says, these, however, in comparison with the hundreds of thousands scattered throughout the provinces of Medo-Persia, were but a remnant. Notice, notice this. The great majority of the Israelites had chosen to remain in the land of their exile rather than undergo the hardships of the return journey and the reestablishment of their desolated cities and homes. So even though God was calling them to engage in revival and reformation, they didn't want to deal with hardship. And notice, 
They didn't want to deal with hardship so much that they were willing to remain in captivity. I wonder if that has any correlation to us in this day and age. You see, brothers and sisters, deliverance from sin has been freely offered to us. But in order to escape from the thraldom of sin, we have to cooperate with God. God is not just going to arbitrarily take us to heaven. He's not just going to arbitrarily save us from sin. We have to cooperate with him. And that means voluntarily giving up those things that are impeding our relationship with God. You know, I remember reading in the Spirit of Prophecy, and it was saying that dying to self will literally feel like, like you are sucking the life force out of your body. That's what it really feels like when we are sacrificing the carnal mind. And if we are not going through these experiences, we have to legitimately ask ourselves the question, are we really dying to self? All right, it says, of the return journey, we read that already. This is taken from Prophets and Kings. This says, a score or more of years pass by when a second decree, quite as favorable as the first, was issued by Darius Histopes, the monarch then ruling. Thus did God in what? Mercy provide another opportunity for the Jews in the Medo-Persian realm to return to the land of their fathers. Now, I wonder why God was being so insistent upon them getting out of Medo-Persia. I wonder if God knew that something very terrible was about to come upon the, upon the ancient Hebrews. Notice, the Lord foresaw that troublous times, uh, the troublous times that were to follow during the reign of Xerxes, the Ahasuerus of the book of what? This evening, we're going to talk about the experience of Esther, the experience of Esther. And he not only wrought a change of feeling in the hearts of men in authority, but also inspired Zechariah to plead with the exiles to what? To return. Now, in light of that, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Esther. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Esther chapter 1. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Esther chapter 1. Now, this is just as a means of context. Now, mind you, God was urging the Hebrews to leave the Medo-Persian realm because he knew that something was coming. Now, in light of what we're about to read in the book of Esther, and I believe that all of us are familiar with the book of Esther, principally, should the experience of Esther have ever happened? It should have never happened. Principally, if all of the Jews had left the Medo-Persian realm when they were supposed to, the experience and the book of Esther would have never taken place. Notice. Esther chapter 1, starting in verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over an hundred and seven and twenty provinces, that in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the palace, in the thirty of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his what? And his servants. The power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even at hundred and fourscore what? So for a hundred and eighty days, they were just feasting and reveling. I mean, can you imagine? the amount of debauchery that was taking place during that party. I mean, people think that they have parties today. They have nothing on what these men used to do in the past. I mean, just complete and utter debauchery. Now, as you go through Esther chapter 1, uh, Ahasuerus has, uh, had a wife, and she was uh, asked to be called in, and she refused it. And as a result of that, Ahasuerus was now searching for a new wife. In light of that, let's go to Esther chapter 2. Esther chapter 2, it says, After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what was decreed against her. It says, Then said the king's servant that ministered unto him, Let there be a be fair young virgin sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan the palace. 
to the house of the women unto the custody of the hedge, uh, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their things for purification be given. And let the maiden which pleaseth the king be queen instead of Ashtai, and the thing pleased the king, and he did what? And he did so. Verse 5. Now in Shushan the palace there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity which had been carried away with jo uh, Jonah, uh, Jokot, Jaconia, thank you, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And in, and in verse 7 it says, And he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. Now in light of that, who do you think this is? This is an artist's rendition of Queen Esther. An artist's rendition of Queen Esther. So we realize that Hadassah or Esther, she becomes queen of the entire Medo-Persian realm. And unfortunately, there were certain things that, that Haman had uh, uh, antipathy against Mordecai for all of the things that he uh, was doing. The fact that he did not give abeyance and bow down and worship him. And in light of that, we read this. This says, the crisis that Esther faced demanded quick, earnest what? Action. Let's actually read what that crisis was. Let's turn to Esther chapter 4. Let's turn to Esther chapter 4. And we're going to start in verse 7. It says, And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him, and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the uh, king's treasurers for the Jews to destroy them. Also, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther, and to decree it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him, and to make request before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again, Esther spake un unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whatso whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to what? To death. Except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words, and Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another what? From another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed and who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Brothers and sisters, do you believe that God permitted us to be born for such a time as this? Now, this is something for us to just solemnly think about. God could have ordained for us to live during the time of Moses. God could have ordained for us to live during the time of Daniel. God could have ordained for us to be the literal children of Adam. For us to be living with Adam and Eve in their physical presence. For us to still, still see the Garden of Eden. For us to still see the angels. For us to see the Leviathan and all of these things. But God permitted us to be born at this junction of the world's history. Again, why do you think God wanted us to be born at this time? Do you think that, uh, that that solemn calling was just for Esther, or do you think it's for us as well? It's for us as well. This says, but both she and Mordecai realized that unless God should work mightily in their behalf, their own efforts would be unavailing. So Esther took time for communion with God, the source of her strength. 
All right, and it quotes um, verse 16 and all these things. It says, the decree that will finally, notice this, notice this. The decree that will finally go forth against the remnant people of God will be very similar to that issued by a hazardous against the what? Against the Jews. So the same principles that Satan used in order to, dis- to try to destroy the ancient Hebrews when they were in Medo-Persia are the same principles that Satan is going to use in order to try to destroy us in this generation. Does that make sense? It says, Today the enemies of the true church see in the little company keeping the Sabbath commandment a Mordecai in the gate. The reverence of God's people for his law is a constant rebuke to those who have cast off the fear of the Lord and are trampling upon his what? You know, we're told that even the name Seventh-day Adventist is an open rebuke to those who keep the first day of the week. This says Satan will arouse indignation against the minority who refuse to accept popular customs and tradition. Wealth, genius, education will combine to cover them with what? Contempt. On this battlefield will be fought the last great conflict in the controversy between what? Between truth and error. Between Christ and Satan. Brothers and sisters, are we living in a great controversy? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Now, what is this? What is this? When you see this picture, what Bible text come to your imagination? Revelation 12. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Revelation, and we're going to read in chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. We're going to read in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Notice what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Revelation chapter 12, we're going to read in verse 17. The Bible says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman. And again, when you are wroth, when a person is wroth, does this mean that you are very happy with an individual? No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that you want to uh, lick lollipops with them. You want to get some ice cream with them. No. Furious. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. What does that word remnant mean? So the remaining of the woman's offspring, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of what? The testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, what uh, time period context is uh, verse 17 referring to? What time period context? Well, let's read it. Let's read it. We're going to read. We're going to read in verse. uh, Verse number 10. Verse number 10. Verse number 10, it says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is what? Cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And it says in verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Now notice what the Bible says in verse 14, as it pertains to the time context of this woman's experience. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the what? So after the salvation and strength came, the woman had to fly into the wilderness. It says, uh, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the what? From the face of the serpent. Time, times, and half a time. Now what is that time, times, and half a time that the Bible is referring to in verse 14? Yes, that's the 1260 years of papal supremacy. Now, when did the 1260 years of papal supremacy begin? There's only a few voices. It began in 538. 538. Now, what year did it end? It ended in 1798, from 538 to 1798. So, verse 17, is this before verse 14 or after verse 14? I promise you, I did not just uh, uh, ask a trick question. I promise. Is verse 17 before or after verse 17? It's after verse 17. So by default, the the, uh, experience that is taking place in verse 17 must be taking place 
after 1798. Does that make sense? All right, so this says that the development of this woman's seed in this remnant context would take place after 1798. Does that make sense? And it says that the characteristics of the remnant of her seed are those which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, what are the commandments of God? The Ten Commandments, what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Okay, the spirit of prophecy, uh, where is that in the Bible? Okay, only a few voices. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 19. You see, because there's many things that we may know intellectually, but we can't actually find them in the Bible. All right, Revelation 19 verse 10, it says, And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of what? The spirit of prophecy. This is the same spirit of prophecy that Moses had, Jeremiah had, uh, Ezekiel, Daniel, all of the patriarchs, well, specifically the prophets, that God whom he put his spirit upon. Now, in light of that, notice this. This is taken from volume seven of the testimonies. Seventh-day Adventists have been chosen by God as a peculiar people separate from the world. By the great cleaver of truth, he has cut them out from the quarry of the world and brought them into connection with what? Himself. He has made them his representatives and has called them to be ambassadors for him in the last work of salvation. Notice, the greatest wealth of truth ever entrusted to mortals, the most solemn and fearful warnings ever sent by God to man have been committed to them. Now, who is the them? Seventh-day Adventists. And in accomplishment of this work, our publishing houses are among the most effective agencies. Again, this is taken from the testimonies that says, God has called his church in this day, as he called ancient Israel, to stand as a light in the earth. By the mighty cleaver of truth, the messages of the what? So God used the three angels' messages to cut us out of the world. Do you follow that process? So God used these three message, messages to take us out of the world the same way God called Abraham and took him out of Ur of the Chaldees. It says, He has separated them from the churches and from the world to bring them into a sacred nearness to himself. It says the three angels of Revelation 14 represent the people who accept the light of God's messages and go forth as his agents to sound the warning throughout the length and breadth of the earth. Nothing is to be permitted to hinder this what? So do we have a special calling as seven-day Adventists? We have a very special calling. And again, the purpose of this revival and reformation series is to help us to understand by God's grace to some degree, the great calling that we have as his distinct remnant people and encouraging us to have the spirit of God the way the Lord so desires. Notice. Now, when you see this picture, what comes to your imagination? Now, for the remainder of this uh, particular message, we want to see at least to some degree the mechanisms that Satan is going to use to bring this great crisis upon us as God's people and the entire world. Now, when you see this picture, what are some of the thoughts that come to your imagination? Freemasonry, what else? Spiritualism, yes, what else? Witchcraft, yes, what else? Idolatry, yes, what else? Astrology, yes, what else? Yes, all of these things are, are encapsulated in this picture. This is a symbol of something called social engineering. Now, has anybody ever heard of the concept of social engineering? You see, these dear people at the bottom are literally being brainwashed by this mechanism. By this force of people, these people at the bottom are being brainwashed. Do you think that the vast majority of the world's population is being brainwashed? Yes. Brothers and sisters, unfortunately, we are being brainwashed intentionally, and unless we come to Christ, we'll be sucked in to this vortex. Notice. Well, somebody says, well, well, that's just a conspiracy theory. You have no proof 
to validate that position. Notice this. This is a woman by the name of Marilyn Ferguson. She wrote a book called The Aquarian Conspiracy in the 20th Century. Notice this. We don't have time to go through all these details, but we want to get to a point. A leaderless but powerful network is working to bring about radical changes in the United States. Its members have broken with certain key elements of Western thought, and they may have, and they may even have broken continuity with history. Going on. Now, what is this right here? What is this a picture of? Do you think that television is one of these means of social engineering that Satan is using in order to brainwash us? You see, because when this great crisis over the seal of God and the mark of the beast comes, many people are just going to fold to it because they have been conditioned to love it. They've been following it in principle almost all their lives. So when it comes to them in their face, they are willing to go along with the status quo. Now, it's amazing. It's as if this never happened. But does everybody remember COVID? Does everybody remember all, the, all of the draconian laws that were enacted during COVID? And it's amazing, and it's so sad, not a means of condemnation, how many people just blindly went along with all of those measures that were enacted in order to combat the virus. But that's another, that's another subject. All right, notice this. Television has come to delineate for us the boundaries of transgressions. The medium operates as a subtle instructor with the complicity of the what? Of the audience. No one denies that television amplifies the process of change in fashion and ideas, sometimes sparking off political eruptions. Tel the television image has thus come to govern the senses and the conscience, to offer an ordering of things, even to exaggerate the chaos and orderlessness of things. Notice. Now, what is this? This is the news. Now, again, it doesn't matter what news outlet you watch. You are being intentionally lied to. It doesn't matter what the news outlet is. It doesn't matter if it's so-called conservative. It doesn't matter if it's so-called liberal or Democrat, whatever the case may be. You are being intentionally lied to. Now, all of these news mechanisms do communicate some aspect of truth, but in total, they're lying to you. Notice, well, somebody says, well, I'm a Democrat, I, I believe in the truth. Well, somebody says, I'm a Republican, I believe in the truth. This is taken from a book called To Kill a Nation. The U.S. media, as with most of the news media in other Western nations, are not free and independent. They are owned and controlled by largely conservative corporate cartels. The goal of these political economic elites it's to transform the world into a what? Now, the Bible tells us very clearly that very soon no man will be able to buy or sell unless he has the mark of the beast. And these news mechanisms and all of these multinational corporations are heading the world to this objective. All right. This is a gentleman by the name of Edward Bernays. He wrote a book called Propaganda. This, is, this man is, is largely responsible to a great degree as to why so much of the United States and the entire world got hooked on cigarettes during the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Notice. He says, The conscience and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. So he's saying, in order for us to have a democracy, the people who rule us need to intentionally manipulate us. And we think because we see these politicians on television that we know them personally. Oh, I know, I know him. He would never do that. I know her. She would never do that. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government. We're actually about to find that the government is not invisible. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes form, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as a smoothly functioning society. So these ruling elite persons, they, they believe that the only way society can function is if we intelligently manipulate those who are beneath us. 
Now, in light of that, who do you think is really behind all of this um, Satanism? Satan. Satan. If Satan were permitted to run the entire universe, how Satan runs this planet is how he would govern the rest of creation. This is why sin must be destroyed. This is why Satan must be killed. This says continuous interpretation is achieved by trying to control every approach to the public mind in such a manner that the public receives the desired impression. It's amazing. Seventy years ago, Christians used to have very staunch opinions on things like homosexuality. But now we live in a time where those, where those same Christian persons have radically different ideas from what they used to in the past. Notice, the American motion picture is the greatest unconscious carrier of propaganda in the world today. So when we go to the movie theater, we're receiving nothing but propaganda. You are being conditioned to receive the mark of the beast. This is why God told us very clearly that we were to stay completely away from these things. Stay away from it. All right, we're getting to a point. Does anybody know what this is? That, that, that is a symbol of the Vatican. I wonder if the Vatican is behind all of this. Notice. Anybody know who that man was? This man just died at the age of 100. Henry Kissinger, that unfortunate war criminal. Notice. This is a book that he wrote called World Order. This says religious unity had fractured with the survival and spread of Protestantism. The Protestant Reformation destroyed the concept of a world order sustained by the two swords of papacy and empire. And this is an astonishing statement. This man is saying that the only reason why we do not live under a proper one world order was as a result of the Protestant Reformation. Now, who helped to lead out in the Protestant Reformation? Martin Luther. Was Martin Luther a man of God? Who else? John Wesley. Who else? John, uh, yes, John Wycliffe, who else? Tyndale, who else? Zwingli, who else? John Calvin, yes. All of these men that God used to initiate and to further along this Protestant Reformation. All right, this is a gentleman by the name of Malachi Martin. I know that we're going over a lot of information, but I'm just praying that by God's grace, we can understand at least in some principle what Satan is br trying to bring upon this planet. This man was a Jesuit priest. This is in a book that he wrote called The Keys of This Blood. Anybody ever heard of a book called The Keys of This Blood? Only a few of us. This says what captures the unwavering attention of the secular leaders of the world is this remarkable network of the Roman Catholic Church is, that, is precisely the fact that it places at the personal disposal of the Pope a supranational, super supercontinental, super straight trade block structure that is so built and orientated that if tomorrow or next week by a sudden miracle a one world government were established the church would have to undergo no essential any essential structural change in order to retain its dominant position and to further its global aims notice at the bottom at his most specific however he speaking of john paul ii insists that men have no reliable hope of creating a geopolitical system unless it is on the basis of Roman Catholic Christianity. So John Paul II was saying that the only way that the governments of this world can have a one world order is if it's based upon Roman Catholic Christianity. Now in light of that, who do you think is going to be at the head of this system? The Pope. Brothers and sisters, Satan is trying to bring the world back into the same condition that Western Europe was in during the dark and Middle Ages. This is why it is so essential for us to study and understand history. This is why it's so important. All right, uh, we're going to skip past this. We have a little bit more information to get through. Again, this is a symbol of the Vatican, a symbol of the Vatican flag. Now, does anybody know who this man was? Man by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte, that French emperor and conqueror. Notice. Notice what Napoleon... Now, was Napoleon a conspiracy theorist? Notice. The Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. This is from Napoleon. 
Their chief is a general of an army, not the fear of mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is the glory of God. Power. Power in its most despotic exercise, absolute power, universal power, power to control the, the world by the volition of a single man. And again, who is, who is going to be that single man? The Pope. Wherever the Jesuits are admitted, they will be the masters, cost what it may. Their society is by nature dictatorial, and therefore it is the irreconcilable enemy of all constituted authority. Now, do we have constituted authority here in the United States? Yes, we do. So in light of that, do you think that the Jesuits should be in the U.S. government? But are they in the U.S. government? Yes, they are. Notice. Anybody know who this man was? This is a man by the name of Marquise de Lafayette. This man was a, a, a Jewish a, a military officer in the 17th century, if I'm not mistaken. Notice what he said. It is my opinion that if the liberties of this country, the United States of America, are destroyed, it will be by the subtlety of the Roman Catholic Jesuit priests, for they are the most crafty, dangerous enemies to civil and religious liberty. Notice, no, notice this. They have instigated most of the wars of what? Most of the wars of Europe. Lord have mercy. I wish we had time. Anybody know who this man is or was? A man by the name of Edmund Paris. He wrote a book called The Secret History of the Jesuits. Notice what he said. The public is practically unaware of the overwhelming responsibility carried by the Vatican and its Jesuits in the start of the two world wars. Did you know that the Vatican and the Jesuits started predominantly World War I and World War II? A situation which may be explained in part by the gigantic finances. You know, many times when we have war, we rarely ask the question, where do these nations get all the money to engage in war? Can you kill and, and drop bombs for free? It costs money. And the question is, where does all the money come from? It says, this study is based on irrefutable archive documents. This is not a conspiracy theory. Do you know that this is one of the main reasons why there was so much antagonism against Catholicism in the United States when this nation first began? Because the settlers, settlers from Europe they understood the influence that Roman Catholicism has over a state. And this is part of the reason why our Constitution was made the way it was. It is. This is shown by the name of Thomas J. Reese, a Jesuit in the United States government. This man was appointed by Barack Hussein Obama as the leader for religious liberty in the U.S. government. Can you imagine that? A Jesuit steering the United States on religious liberty. We're getting to a point. It says, despite the importance of the papacy for the Catholic Church and its prominent role in international affairs, its internal workings are little known to Catholics, to world leaders, or to the world at what? To the world at large. So when we see Pope Francis on television, are we really getting a truthful account of what's really going on? No, we're not. This, partly, this is partly a result of the secretive nature of the Vatican, which sees little advantage to letting others know its internal operations. And we're even at a point where the vast majority of Seventh-day Adventist preachers are afraid to talk about these things. It is rare where you even just get regular Christian preachers to talk about the reality of the Antichrist. I'm telling you, our Protestant forefathers would literally roll in their grave as it were if they could see the condition of so-called Protestantism. All right, we're going uh, to go, back, uh, go past this. We just don't have time. Now, again, this is a symbol of the Vatican as we seek to bring this to a close. A gentleman by the name of J.A. Wiley. Notice, in the second place, the pontiffs claim to be the successors of the apostles. Now, were the popes the successors of the apostles? No, they weren't. This was a more masterly stroke of policy still. To the temporal dominion of the Caesars, they added the spiritual authority of the apostles. It is here that the great strength of the papacy lies. 
The one made him king, the other made him king of kings. What blasphemy. It is the ghost of Peter with the shadowy diadem of the old Caesars. Evangelism, notice what the spirit of prophecy says in regards to this reality. In the very time in which we live, the Lord has called his people and has given them a message to bear. He has called them to expose, not conceal, not, ju not give justification for, but he has called them to expose the wickedness of the man of sin who has made the Sunday law a distinctive what? Who has thought to change times in what? Even to this point where the great uh, religious liberty leader for the general conference is greatly encouraging all of this ecumenical cohesion. Lord have mercy. We may talk about it tomorrow. It says, and to oppress the people of God who stand firmly to honor him by keeping the one, the only true Sabbath, the Sabbath of creation as holy unto the Lord. Now, just by artist rendition, who do you think this is? In light of this context, with the water and this other person. John the Baptist, yes. Now, was John the Baptist a God-fearing man of the Lord? Yes, he was. Notice what the Spirit of Prophecy says about John the Baptist. In this fearful time, just before Christ is to come the second time, God's faithful preachers, not unfaithful, but faithful preachers, will have to bear a still more pointed testimony than was born by John the Baptist. Now, that is extremely serious. Was John the Baptist a very straight preacher? But the spirit of prophecy says that God's ministers in this generation will have to be even straighter than John the Baptist. Can you imagine? Now, what did John the Baptist say to those religious leaders? He called them a generation of lambs. Is that what he said? That they were a generation of vipers. They were hypocrites. So if John the Baptist said that they were vipers in that day, what are they in this day? Lord have mercy. A responsible, important work is before them. And notice, and those who speak smooth things, God will not acknowledge them as his shepherds. I don't care what the man's position is. If he does not faithfully preach the messages that God has called us to preach, God does not acknowledge that man or woman as a leader in the cause of God. Point blank, period. Doesn't matter what the man's position is. All right, we're bringing this to a close. This says, Pope Francis warns against preachers who sow division online. I wonder what pe preachers Pope Francis is referring to. This is taken from 2021. Brothers and sisters, I just pray that we really understand how serious and how close we are to the breaking out of this reality. God is calling for men and women who are willing to stand and be counted. Because it is not going to be a large amount of people that are going to be standing for God when this becomes the reality. And it may seem very convenient to call ourselves Seventh-day Adventists. We can come to church every week, drive our nice cars, go to work, go on vacation and all these things. But when death is the penalty for keeping the law of God, it's going to truly show who, who of us really loves the Lord. This says, at his general audience on Wednesday, Pope Francis warned against preachers who sow division and mistrust online. There is no shortage of preachers who, especially through the new means of communication, can disturb communities. Lord have mercy. They present themselves not primarily to announce the gospel of God who loves man and Jesus, crucified and risen, but to insist as true keepers of the truth, Lord have mercy, what is the best way to be what? And, and, and just notice the hypocrisy because the Catholic Church teaches that there is no salvation outside of the Catholic Church. And they strongly affirm that the true Christianity is the one they adhere to often identified with certain forms of the past. We don't have time to go through all the hypocrisy. All right. Notice at the bottom, Pope Francis said that this is exactly the way that the evil one seeks to divide Christian communities today. So, he, so Pope Francis is saying that if you are one of these preachers or even just a person that is sharing the true gospel of Christ on social media, that you are a messenger of the evil one. 
Brothers and sisters, when this says evil one, who is he referring to? He's actually referring to God. Notice this. You see, because when you study the idiosyncrasies of the philosophy that these men believe, they are actually openly and covertly worshiping Satan. Notice. Notice this. We're bringing this to a close. Anybody know who this man was? A gentleman by the name of Albert Pike. He was a very high-ranking 33rd degree Freemason in the 20th, uh, 19th and 20th century. Notice what he said. The Templars, like all other secret orders and associations, had two doctrines. How many doctrines? Two doctrines. One concealed and reserved for the masters, which was Johansenism. Johannism. The other public, which was the Roman Catholic. So this is saying, throughout the ages of Roman Catholicism, there was always a religion that they gave to the masses, but there was a secret esoteric religion that the hierarchy practiced. Does that make sense? This is why so many Roman Catholic priests are raping little boys, because it's a part of their esoteric religion. Lord have mercy. Thus, they deceived the adversaries whom, whom they sought to supplant. Notice, the deity of the Old Testament is everywhere represented as the direct author of evil. Now, who is the deity of the Old Testament? God. So these men and women literally believe that the God of the Bible is Satan. Lord have mercy. This is why the Bible says in Isaiah, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. This is the historical context. Commissioning evil and lying spirits to men, hardening the heart of Pharaoh. Now, did God harden the heart of Pharaoh? He hardened his own heart. As the Bible says in the book of 1 Samuel. And visiting the iniquity of the individual sinner on the whole people. So they're saying God is arbitrary. He just loves to destroy everything when he doesn't get his way. It was so mean what he did to that peace-loving city of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was so wicked what he did to the antediluvian world destroying them by a flood. He's a mean God. We're coming to a close. One by the name of Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. Notice what this woman said. Very prominent esoteric writer in a book that she wrote called The Secret Doctrine. The appellation in Hebrew, Satan and adversary, from the verb shatana, to be adverse, adverse uh, to, belongs by right to the first and cruelest adversary of all the other gods. Who? Jehovah. And not to the serpent. Notice which spoke only words of sympathy and wisdom. Lord, have this is what these men and women truly believe. That Satan was the great benefactor of humanity and that we would still be in darkness if not for the beneficence of the serpent. You would still be a fool if I had not come to you and given you the fruit. Just like in movies. And is at the worst, even in the dogma, the adversary of men. Therefore, Jehovah was called by the Gnostics, which we had time to talk about them, the creator of and one with of, of Aphimorphos, the serpent Satan or, or evil. Is our last, is our last slide. This is a symbol of the United States and the papacy. Now, does the Bible talk about the United States and the papacy in Revelation 13? Yes, it does. Notice. Now, is everybody following the point? Everybody following the point? I know that we're rushing through. It says, but Romanism, this is great controversy, but Romanism as a system is no more in harmony with the gospel of Christ now than at any former period in her history. Now, are there very many God-fearing people who are Roman Catholics? Yes. Do you think that they have any idea of what we just talked about? So in light of that, do we have an obligation to share this truth with them? Yes, we do. The Protestant churches are in a little darkness, great darkness, or they would discern the signs of the times. Now, do the, now do the great Sunday churches of this world understand the signs of the times? No, many of them are running to Jerusalem because they still believe that the Jews are still God's chosen people. This is why so many evangelicals are in favor of the genocide taking place right now in Palestine. 
This says she is employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world, to reestablish persecution, and to undo all that Protestantism has done. See the increasing number of her churches and chapels in Protestant countries. Look at the popularity of her colleges and what? And again, how many of us are going to these Roman Catholic institutions? Again, at the bottom, these things should awaken the anxiety of all who prize the pure principles of the gospel. And this is our last statement. Probably the most consequential. Now, in light of this, who here wants to be a part of the Roman Catholic system? By show of hands. But I wonder if in spirit we are Roman Catholic. The papacy is well adapted to meet the wants of all these. It is prepared for two classes of mankind embracing nearly the whole world. Number one, those who would be saved by their what? So if you want to be saved by your own works, you're already a Roman Catholic. And those who would be saved in their sins. So if you want to keep on sinning, but you still want heaven, you are already a Roman Catholic. Here is the secret of its power. You see, brothers and sisters, this last great conflict is truly over whether or not we as individuals are going to permit the gospel of Jesus Christ to do in our hearts what the Bible says that it can do. Now, what does the gospel promise us as individuals? What does it promise to us? Eternal life. Now, now, is there any sin in eternal life? Do you know that the gospel promises that if we yoke ourselves up with Jesus so much that he will bring us back to the same condition that Adam and Eve were in before they fell into sin? Now, when Adam and Eve, before Adam and Eve fell into sin, did Adam and Eve know how to sin? Brothers and sisters, just think about this. God is promising that if we truly have faith in him, that he will bring us to a point where we won't even know how to commit sin. Can you imagine? Not even to have one propensity to do that which is wrong. That when you see any type of evil or unrighteousness, your very nature recoils from it, no matter how minor. Now, mind you, when Adam and Eve sinned, did they go and commit mass murder? Was that the sin that they committed? What, what, did, did, uh, did Adam go and cheat on his wife? Was that the sin that was committed? What was the, the specific sin that they committed? They merely ate a fruit that God told them not to eat. Just the fruit. And it unleashed all of this. So God is promising to get us to the point that we will so see sin for what it is that by God's grace, we will shun it as the leprosy. And just by show of hands, who wants the gospel of Jesus Christ to do this in their own experience? Amen. And in light of that, let us have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, the things that you have not only communicated tonight, but this entire Revival and Reformation series, the Lord, I just pray that you would help us to really go back and meditate on these principles. For just like the ancient Hebrews, it is now to come out of captivity. And unfortunately, because we have lingered just as the Hebrews did in the days of Esther, there is a storm that is coming. But dear Father, just like you did for those ancient Hebrews in the Medo-Persian realm, you have provided a shelter in the time of storm, a mighty rock in a weary land, a cooling shade for the burning sand. And so, faithful God, we just pray that you would help us to be found under the shadow of the Almighty, that we will not cling to our own righteousness, that we will not cling to our own sin, but that we will give these things to you, that we will accept this beautiful robe of righteousness, that we may be found hidden in Jesus. And we pray, Holy Father, that you would please keep us to this end and until we prepare to come out tomorrow morning to study and to fellowship in spirit and in truth. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.